have our live Q&A sessions here at Coptic Orthodox Answers. As you guys know, once a month we gather together and we have these live Q&As so that we can give everyone a chance to be able to ask their questions and hopefully get some quick and short answers uh, to some of the questions that they have. Now, as you guys know, we launch videos on a regular basis, whether it be through Apostolic Answers, where we have these short, less than 10 minute videos to try to answer some questions. We have the deep dive videos that Father Gabriel is doing right now, specifically on the Gospel of St. John, where we spend 20 minutes to half an hour every single video, diving very deep and understanding the commentary um, and the theological understanding of the Gospel of St. John, and hopefully we'll begin a new series also in the deep dive very soon. And we also have Words of Wisdom. The Words of Wisdom, its entire purpose is to share with you these little nuggets of inspiration, these beautiful words of wisdom that we have found spoken by the Holy Spirit through other fathers and through other teachers in the church. Now, we share those for the purpose of showing you how much beauty and how much wealth there is in trying to discover the beauty of orthodoxy and the beauty of the Christian faith that we have. Uh, so again, please continue to keep us in your prayers and supporting us by praying for us and by sharing the content. Now let's go ahead and jump right into it for our live Q&A session. So please feel free, go ahead and ask your questions directly live through the Facebook platform. Uh, and as soon as they come in, we'll start answering them. And in the meantime, while people are joining in and while people are asking their questions, we're going to go ahead and try to answer some questions that have come in in the past through either the website or through Facebook or through other different social social media platforms that we have received. So the first question that comes in to us is asked the following. Father, sometimes I struggle deeply with depression or anxiety surrounding my repentance. I feel like there is no hope because the sins that I commit are oftentimes things that I have done over the last several years and cannot stop. How do I deal with the despair that I face in my repentance? Thank you to the person who's asked this question because very, very clearly, I want you to be reassured you are far from being the only person who struggles with this. You are far from being the only person who is tempted to believe that there is no hope for you, who is tempted to believe that there is a certain level of despair that has to be, um, that has to be almost embraced. And it's, it's so sad that we use that kind of language, but in the moments of our despair, we really feel like that. We almost find comfort in our weakness. We find comfort in our defeat. And it's very ironic because that's not the way we're supposed to feel, but yet this is the way we feel. We're face down in the mud and we say we're comfortable here. This is where we always land. Just leave us be. And I want you to know to the person who's asked this question that you are far from being the only person who does this. The same demon, the same enemy of mankind, that serpent of old, Satan, tempts you and I and every other Christian person who pursues repentance and holiness and sanctification in the same way. At first, what the devil will do is that he will fill you with pride. St. Anthony actually says a statement that is extremely provocative, sometimes very, very scary when you think about it. He says, sometimes the demons will allow you a moment for you to embrace your victory in repentance. And so he will let you be for a moment until you swell up with pride. And then the demon will return and he says he will return with seven of his friends. I don't know where he got the number seven, but that number is scary. He will return with seven of his friends, says St. Anthony. And he will make you regret the day that you tried to offer repentance. Now this is a very scary image of how it is that we fight in the spiritual warfare. How it is that the whole purpose is to get us to regret the day we try to repent. The whole purpose is to get us to think that there is no hope for us. My well, beloved, we know that this is not true. We actually know that the war has already been won. Christ turns to his disciples and he says to them, as he says to us even today, he says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The war is already fought and the war is already won and Christ is the victor and we believe that he has granted us that victory. Our responsibility is to embrace that victory. Our responsibility is to run towards him and to believe in his promises of mercy and grace. Our responsibility is to work with the Holy Spirit synergistically and do our part in order for us to be able to receive that grace, to receive that victory and that eternal life. So my beloved, no matter how much we are tempted to despair, no matter how much we are tempted to think there is no hope for us, no matter how tempted we are to think that there is no chance for God to be able to forgive us, or there is no victory that is promised to us because we keep falling in the same sins over and over again, we must remember that we have victory in Christ. We must remember that our responsibility is not to never fall, 
but rather to always get up. The book of Proverbs talks about how it is that the righteous man falls seven times, but gets up seven times. I want you to notice how even Solomon declares that the righteous will fall. It is inevitable for us to be at war. It is inevitable for us to face our weaknesses, to recognize our brokenness. But our holiness is only manifested in the fact that we continuously struggle to pursue God. Stay focused on the fact that you're on the stay focused on the fact that you're on the path towards holiness. Now, whether or not you've arrived at the destination, let God be the author of that decision. You and I are only responsible to make sure that we're on the right path, we're on the right direction, we're pursuing Him aggressively, passionately, and humbly, and that we recognize that we will fall. And the image that I want to give you is an important one. We are oftentimes tempted to think that, let's say we've, by God's glory and by God's grace, we have been granted victory for a period of time. It's been three months, six months, a year, five years, 20 years that God has granted us victory over a specific sin in our life. Do not think for a moment that somehow our value or our our identity is found in how long we've been good. My beloved, that's not how it works. Because if you think like that, you'll also be tempted to think that the moment that you fall, that all is gone, all is erased. Every good thing and every victory that God has granted you is somehow vanished, and now you're back to square one. This actually reminds me of um, a video game that we used to play when we were much younger. At the time, it was like the biggest thing in the world because it was like, wow, we had never seen anything like this. If anybody remembers the first Nintendo consoles, when they came out, there was this game that came out called Super Mario Brothers. Uh, now when Super Mario came out, it was really interesting because what we would do is that we would play this game and if you had not reached the end of the level, let's say you got hit by one of those uh, walking mushroom thingies or those green or red turtles or whatever. Um, for those of you who have played this, you know what I'm talking about. This is nostalgia. It'll bring you back a few years. But as soon as you got hit with one of those things, you would be forced to restart the level. And so sometimes we think that that's the way it works. No matter how close you get to the finish line, we think that as soon as we fall, or as soon as we mess up, we have to restart. And my beloved, I want to tell you, that's not the way it works with God. Rather, the image I want to give you, and I want you to hold on to for the sake of hope, is recognizing that we're running a marathon. And so if we're running a marathon that's 30, 40, 50, 100 kilometers long, if 50, 60 kilometers into it, we fall, we trip, we fall on our knees, we face plant onto the ground, we scraped ourselves, we're bleeding, we're bruised, it is foolish to think that somehow the rules now obligate us to get up, to walk all the way back, to walk and erase those 50 kilometers that I've already walked, those 50 kilometers that I've ran for the sake of being true and faithful to the path that was set before me, that somehow everything is lost. No judge pops out of nowhere and says everything is gone, everything has been wasted, go back and restart. That's not the way that the spiritual life works. And just like a marathon, what we have to recognize is that the faster we get up, the faster we get back on course, because the very next step we take is going to take us towards the 51st kilometer. We've already ran 50. It's not lost. God has brought us this far. If we have fallen, yes, it has cost us time. We might be bruised. It might hurt and we might be scraped and might need healing. But the very next steps we take are still towards His kingdom, still towards that finish line. Do not be foolish in thinking that we are supposed to embrace the lies of the devil when he tries to instill in us despair and a lack of peace and remove from us our joy of repentance. We must get up, we must continue running, we must pursue His grace at all costs. So to the person who has asked the question, I hope uh, that answers a little bit as to how it is that we can deal with despair. Recognize God's promises. Recognize that He is faithful and that He will always deliver on His promises. And when He tells us that He's overcome, we must find joy in that victory that He wants to extend to us. And rather than listening to the lies of the duffel when it comes to despair and the lies of us being unworthy and the lies of us being no good, and while all of those things might be true, I recognize that I am unworthy. I recognize that my sins are no good. I recognize that I am unfaithful. But it's not about that. I remain His Son nonetheless. I remain His nonetheless. And because I am His, that is where I receive holiness. Not because of my own actions. God forbid that I should think that I am the author of my own holiness. Anything that has been granted to me is from Him because I bear His image. 
And so it has nothing to do with my flaws and has everything to do with who he is, how faithful and loving and compassionate he is. If I can trust in that, I will find the courage, the boldness and the strength to be able to get up and to pursue him and not to give in to despair. So to my brother or sister who asked the question, God give you strength, God give you the courage to be able to get up to pursue repentance and may he fill your life with holiness. I hope that answers the question. Sabu, hello my beloved, God bless you and thank you for joining us. Again, my dear friends, if there's any questions who are, if there are any questions that are burning within you and you would like to ask, please feel free to share them on the group and we'll answer them as they come in. Until then, let's go ahead and answer a few more questions that have come in. The next question is regarding the liturgy. Dear Father, do we really confess the real presence of Christ in the liturgy? Or do we believe it simply as us remembering that moment on Covenant Thursday when the Lord had that last supper with his disciple? Very good questions, my beloved. So absolutely, I need us to understand that this is very important. The Orthodox Church does not do things theatrically. We are not doing things simply for the sake of refreshing our memory. So we don't believe in this whole idea of reenacting what happened on that great Thursday. We really do believe in the mystical presence of the Lord Christ with us. We believe in the title, Emmanuel, God with us. Now my beloved, what that really means is that we really do believe that at the beginning of the liturgy, we offer to God from what is His. He's given us the world, He's offered to us creation, and He's asked us to offer it back to Him. So what do we do in the liturgy? We take tree sap and we offer it as incense. We take gold and pigments and we turn them into icons and we place them before God. We take the finest vestments that we have and the, the finest golds and purples and reds and we turn them into vestments and we offer them to God in the liturgy. We take marble and we turn them into an altar so that it can be beautiful for God. We take metal and we mold it and we turn it into a censer. We take wheat and we turn it into bread. We take wine and water, we place it in the chalice and we offer it back to God. We take all of creation and we place it before Him Eucharistically. We offer Him thanks for what He's given to us. And we tell Him, Lord, we offer back to You what You have given to us. And what does He do in return? He takes what we have given to Him, which He originally gave to us, and then He offers us Himself. I think it was most beautifully said, and I just heard this last weekend um, by Archbishop uh, Dionysius of the Syriac Church, and he said it so beautifully. It was at a conference for Agora University, a symposium that was held in New Jersey, and it was so beautifully said that I have to repeat it. He says, we have a God who loves us so much, and he is so humble that he was willing to hide himself in a piece of bread in order to be with us. This is what we really believe. We really believe that God places himself in this form of bread and wine, so we can receive Him. So do I believe that truly this is the presence of Christ among us? Absolutely. Do I believe that this is His body? Absolutely. Do I believe that that is His blood? That I am receiving His life? Absolutely. And this is why at the end of the liturgy, you will hear the priest or the bishop who is presiding say the words, Amen, 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 I believe, I believe, I believe, and I confess to the last breath that this is what this is the life-giving flesh of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, which He has taken from Our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Theotokos. And then we go on to explain who we believe Christ is, but we really believe that this is the life-giving flesh. My beloved, how does it happen? Is, is, it, is it, if we put it under a microscope, will we see blood vessels and this and that? My beloved, forget that scientific approach. We believe that mystically, that the Lord reveals Himself to us through a mystery that we cannot possibly understand. But we approach in reverence and we believe that this is truly His body and this is truly His blood. And we are not reproducing this. So don't think for a moment that because of the city that you live in, that there are four churches, that there are four bodies of Christ and three and four chalices that have four bloods of Christ. No, it is always the same Christ. We are in the church, taken up into heaven, outside of time. We are participating with the kingdom of God in that eternal moment. We are participating outside of time in that great Thursday. We are sitting at His table and it is Him who offers Himself. It is not the priest. It is not the bishop who does any of the sanctifying. It is the Lord Himself. It is His hands. And, and, and I know that this might sound very scandalous, but you'll have to believe me when I tell you, we really do believe that the hands that are offered by the priest 
are the hands that Christ uses. It is His hands that break, it is His hands that offer. And He offers Himself in the same way He told His disciples, take, eat of it, all of you, for this is my body. And He says, take, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood. And so we truly believe in the real mystical presence of Christ among us. And we believe that when we receive Him, we receive His body, we receive His precious blood. And in so doing, we participate in the mystery of mysteries. And the holies are offered to the holy. And in that process, His people become His. He unifies the body. He dwells within us. He renews us through this mystery of His life-giving body and blood. So to the person who's asked the question, rest assured, it's not theater. It's not reenactment. It's not this idea of simply remembering what was done 2,000 years ago. No, it's participating in that eternal and life-giving moment where He offers Himself. Now somebody might ask the question, do you then believe that you're cannibals because you eat and you profess that this is the body and the blood of Christ? Well, I would urge that person to realize Christ didn't go to that table at the Passover supper and say, here, all of you, take a bite out of me. It wasn't about eat this flesh. It was receive me in this way. And this is truly my body. And this is truly my blood. And so in the process, we don't have to start adding these explanations of do you really believe it's his body as if like you would take a chunk right out of him and bite him? My beloved, these are just ways of talking that are more confusing and more div divisional than anything else. We must believe in what it is that the Lord has done on that great Thursday and in his profession that this is his body and that he is uniting himself to his bride, to his church in that moment. He also does with us at the altar every single liturgy. I pray that that answers the question of the person who's asked the question. We have a question from Sabu that says the following, Father, could you explain Romans 5.18 from an orthodox view? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and the life of all people. Sabu, let me just pull it up so I can make sure that I have it in front of me within its context. And if I can answer it, I'll be happy to. If I can't, you'll have to forgive me. Um, I wouldn't want to answer you something that I am not aware of. But hopefully, hopefully it's something that I've read before and I can share with you. So you said Romans 5 verse 8. Okay, so I'll start from verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me go to 18. For if by one man's offense, this is 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one who is Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the three gift gave to all men, resulting in justification of life. So, Sabu Habibi, what, what we have to understand is that there's a reason why that the church calls Christ a second Adam. Now, I want you to understand what the church means by this. When we speak of the first Adam, we call him the forefather of all humanity. He is the father of all those who are living, the same way that Eve was called the mother of all those who are living. Now, because of the trespass of Adam, all of us inherited this broken, corrupted nature. What he, Adam has passed down to us is this brokenness of humanity, this alienation and separation from God. And while Adam was called to be one with God, while Adam was called to participate in the life of the Holy Trinity, he fell short of that and in the process sinned. He basically fell away from that mark. He missed it completely. He found himself in a state of hamartia. He found himself in a state that was sinful. And so this is how it is that we find ourselves now. Because of Adam, all of humanity, all of his children, all of his offspring, find themselves inheriting that same state, that same brokenness, that same corruption that God never intended for us to have. And so when Christ comes along, he becomes for us that second Adam. He fulfills for us what the first Adam could not fulfill, or what that first Adam failed to fulfill. And I think that's more rightly put, what he failed to fulfill, not what he could not. And so because Christ now becomes the perfect icon of what a human being should be, he shows us what it means to bear the image of God. And because he is the image of the Father, we are now called the image of the image. We are now called to walk in the footsteps of Christ. So instead of only having the option of inheriting corruption, 
Christ has given us the opportunity to inherit true and eternal life in Him. And this is why St. Paul says that although, or he says, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, and here he's speaking of Adam, resulting in condemnation, which was our alienation from God, which was the fact that we inherited death at this point, resulting in condemnation, even so though one man's righteous act, and here he's speaking the righteous act of his offering to the Father, his dying on behalf of all, his choosing to participate in our brokenness. And St. Paul describes this beautifully in the book of Philippians, that he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but came and took on the form of a bondservant, that he emptied himself. This kenosis, this offering of himself, right? This righteous act of the incarnation, and you have to remember, the salvific act of Christ was not only on the cross. The salvific act of Christ is the entire process of salvation, from the incarnation all the way to his, his, the nativity, his birth, his baptism, his ministry, his transfiguration, his entry into Jerusalem, his then uh, betrayal at the hands of his loved ones, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his sending to us the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, all of this culminates into the act of salvation. So when St. Paul says, through one man's righteous act, righteousness will reign in the life, right? That righteous act, the free gift came to all men. And what was that free gift? The grace of salvation. That because He has shown us what Adam did not do, because He showed us what it meant to be reconciled to God, to love both God and to love creation, to love God and all those created in His image, to love God and our neighbor, He resets the standard of what it means to be a human being. And so we approach this verse in realizing, while we inherited death from our first father Adam, in the second Adam, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we receive the antidote. We receive life eternal. We receive salvation. Sabu, I hope that answers a little bit. I know that um, it's a very loaded question and it's a beautiful passage from St. Paul, but I hope it gives you an idea of how it is that we can approach it. One thing I would honestly recommend, if you want to know a little bit more about how the early church fathers interpreted these verses, I suggest that you try to get an app called Katena. Katena is a wonderful application that was created by some of our young men and women in the Orthodox Church who did a tremendous work, truly, and God bless them for their efforts, in trying to uh, put together a database of all the commentaries that they can get from the early church fathers all the way to some modern theologians, um, and they've put it verse by verse. So if you download the app, you'll be able to select the passage that you want, click on the verse, and it'll tell you what related verses there are, as well as be able to have you read some of the commentaries that were written about those specific verses. This is how I myself learn about specific passages. And as I learn, I share, and I'm sure you will do the same. God bless you. God bless you, Bintu Habibi. Thank you for, for being with us. My beloved, again, if there's any more questions, please feel free to ask them. And we'll go, um, we'll try to answer them as they come in. I'll answer maybe one more question that we have from the questions that were sent to us um, through the website and through social media until somebody else asks a question if they would like. So, the question that we have here says the following Dear Father, oftentimes I am tempted to believe that the humility that is asked of me as a Christian will lead to people to taking advantage of me. How am I supposed to understand humility? Does it translate into me being taken advantage of by others? Thank you for that question. And thank you for the person who um, had the courage to be able to ask that because I, I really do believe that humility is one of those things that is often misunderstood um, when we speak of it. Now, you have to understand, humility is not necessarily the act of us thinking less of ourselves. It has nothing to do with me saying, I'm worthless, I'm garbage, I have no meaning, I have no value, I'm a horrible person. That's not the expression of St. Paul when he calls himself the chief of sinners. He is not putting himself down and in the process erasing his identity in Christ. He never stops forgetting or he never forgets that he is an apostle. He never forgets his encounter with Christ. He never forgets the price that was paid for his salvation. He knows who he is in Christ. And yet, paradoxically, he also recognizes his failure, his weakness, his brokenness. But he doesn't walk around acting as if he's worthless. We often speak of Christ as if he is the perfect expression of what it means to be humble. He says, even learn from me, for I am meek and humble. He says this. 
But where do we see Christ walking around putting himself down? He never does that. His humility is found in his kenosis. His humility is found in the fact that he pours himself out. He empties himself both to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. That within the Holy Trinity there is this love that is kenotic. And at the same time, he offers himself to those that he loves without any regard for himself. Humility is found not in thinking less of yourself at the level of your value, but as C.S. Lewis puts it, humility is found in thinking of yourself less. Now, again, this might be confusing, but pay attention to the words. There's a difference between thinking less of yourself and thinking of yourself less. One has to do with your value. That's thinking less of yourself. We don't believe in that. That's not the Christian approach to our identity. What we do believe is thinking of yourself less. That has to do with frequency. It's about not making everything about you. It's realizing that you should not be self-centered. You are not at the center of the universe. Not everyone is expected to tiptoe around your feelings and your emotions. And so in the process, it's okay to allow other people to have precedence. It's okay for me to place another person's needs above my own, to step outside of my comfort zone for the sake of making another feel comfortable and showing love humbly. Now, how does this translate into the question that we receive from one of our brothers talking about, do I have to be a doormat? My beloved, because we don't see this kind of attitude in Christ, we don't see Christ act like a doormat. On the contrary, we see moments where he chooses silence, again, out of wisdom and discernment, he realizes that speaking now would be wrong. We see examples of this, for instance, when he's being asked by the people around him, if you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Right? And he's being challenged. He doesn't humbly say, I deserve those words, I'm a phony, I'm a fake. No. He remains silent, and he offers himself as a lamb, like a sheep before its shearer, says the prophet. But he doesn't do it out of weakness. He does it out of discernment for the greater good. Because later on, we also see another moment, or earlier before that moment, actually, before he finds himself on the cross, where they are having that secret judgment, where they basically judge him in secret, in hiding, and the Sanhedrin accuses him of things, and then he replies to the high priest, and one of the soldiers who is there, or one of the people who is there, slaps Christ across the face. And you see Christ in that moment show his assertiveness. He turns to him and he says, If I have said anything wrong, tell me what I have said. Correct me. But if I have spoken no wrong thing, why do you slap me? We need this kind of boldness. We need this kind of courage. We are not to be doormats. But yet at the same time, what we lack most is discernment. When does the my humility manifest itself in silence? And when does my humility also obligate me to speak up in humility, in love? My beloved, what we lack most is that spirit of discernment. And this is what we ought to be praying for. That God show us when He wants us to speak, when He wants us to be bold and courageous in our stances, and when He wants us to remain silent and to allow even those accusations to happen for the sake of a greater good. If we don't know how to gain that discernment, then we have to surround ourselves with the thoughts of Christ. This is why St. Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also found in Christ Jesus. That mind of Christ has to be instilled in us. And so we gain it by reading Scripture, by embracing His teachings, by reading His words and making them a part of us, by reading the stories of the saints who were one with Him, who have walked that path and who have reached eternity successfully, by embracing those readings, those teachings, by filling our minds and our spirits with those kinds of teachings. It will begin to mold the very programming of our being. It will begin to manifest itself in the way that we act. I hope that answers the question of the person who has asked it. Uh, hopefully, it's helpful in any such way. Uh, my beloved, on that note, it's not necessarily a question, but I do want to share something, uh, because this was something that actually came up just recently um, with a group of people who were speaking to a group of fathers about this issue in regards to what are we supposed to do in face of people speaking something that we don't consider to be true, um, and how are we supposed to deal with, you know, the modern secular world who's constantly accusing us of, you know, being bigoted or um, who is accusing us of being closed-minded towards very specific things that are happening in society. 
And oftentimes we are told, well, you know, sometimes speaking that truth will be offensive, and as a Christian, I shouldn't offend anyone, and so in order not to offend them, I will not speak the truth. I have to tell you, my beloved, I really don't think that that's a solution. I think more than ever, the world is desperately in need of the light of Christ. And the light of Christ cannot shine unless we speak the truth. Now let's be very clear. Speaking the truth is for everyone. But how to speak it is for only those who have the spirit of discernment. What I mean by that is sometimes it is better for me to remain silent until I know how to speak lovingly to my brothers and sisters who have not embraced the truth of Christ, rather than for me to speak the truth and do it aggressively and what they really see is a person who contradicts the very spirit of the gospel that they are trying to preach. What we cannot allow is to believe that somehow tiptoeing around the truth or saying let everyone have their own truth as if truth was somehow subjective, as if truth was somehow something that could be molded by every person's lifestyle or experience or that everyone is free to have their own truth. Well, you are definitely free to believe what you wish, but to make a declaration that there are multiple truths goes completely against the truth of the revelation of God that we know to be true. The truth is the truth because it is the truth. It is not the truth because I said it. I am not the author of truth. But we have a God who came and revealed himself and who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And everyone has to stand in light of that standard and have an answer. And it's not sufficient for us to stand there as Christians and say, let the world believe what they want to believe. And let's agree to disagree. We cannot believe that Christ came and offered himself as a sacrifice for the salvation of the world. We cannot believe in this life-giving manifestation that he came and he showed to the world for the sake of giving us his Holy Spirit, for the sake of us being able to preach the good news of salvation to the world. And at the same time, and forgive me for speaking like this, but it's a cop-out. It's a cop-out when we start to say stuff like, I'm saying it as to not offend anyone. My beloved, if somebody comes and asks you, what do you think of X, Y, and Z? Speak the truth and speak it in love. And if you are afraid to speak and hurt that person's feelings, by all means, ask the Holy Spirit to speak on your tongue. But to simply sit there and say, let, let everyone just believe whatever they want to believe. I'd rather not get involved in these conversations that are highly volatile and there's like, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're very heavily charged with emotion. So I'd rather just let people believe what they want to believe. If you truly believe as a Christian that that belief might lead to their eternal damnation, if you truly do believe that that idea might completely distort the image of God that they bear, how can we remain silent in the sight of such an evil? What I'm going to encourage you to do is not to speak up. I'm not asking you to speak up. I'm asking you to pray with me. I'm asking you to pray with me so that we can ask God to give us the wisdom and the discernment and the true love and humility, the true mind of Christ, the heart of Christ that we need to be able to speak to the world in a way where they will receive it. Now the world will rebel and they will hate us for it. The same way that when you, light a, when you shine a light in a very dark room, there are those who are offended by it. There are those who say, what is that? I don't like that. Shut that off. And they will aggressively tell you, turn that off. But there are others who will see that light and they will say, what is that? I have been searching for a light. I've been tired of the darkness. Where did you get that from? What is the source of that light? And this is what we hope for. That while we shine the light of Christ in truth and in humility and in all subjection to Him, allowing Him to speak, not ourselves, but Him, that there are those who will come to the light and there are those also who will be offended by it. And we don't hope to offend anyone. We hope everyone to receive it with grace. But we were told that the light will be offensive to many. We were already warned that what they have done to our Master, they will do to us. So pray with me. Pray with me that God gives the church and His body and every single one of us the wisdom and the discernment that we need to be able to speak the truth in love. There is a question that has come in from Joseph, and he asks the following. He says, Abuna, God bless you, Habib. Our Lord compares the time Jonah spent in the fish three days and three nights with his own death. And in fact, our Lord's resurrection was on the third day. How does this fit together? And what does our Lord mean with his brothers in Matthew 12, 46? Are these the sons of Joseph or his first marriage? Or are there his family members like cousins? Or could that be his disciples? Do you have any idea why God chose such a sentence when we consider that this sentence has the potential of confusing and misunderstanding? So Joseph, how do you ask two different questions? The first one is, how do we compare Christ to um, 
uh, to Jonah. So exactly like you said, the Lord speaks and He says only the sign that will be given to them is exactly the sign that was given to the people at the time of Jonah. Right? That he will come out of the pangs of death, he will come out of the pits of death, the same way that Jonah was considered dead. A man has come back to life. He was thrown into the ocean, we did not see any sign of him, we saw the fish swallow him, and then from death arises this Jonah who comes out of there after three days and three nights. Now, so Joseph, what I'm understanding from that question is that based on your calculations, how do we see three days and three nights with Christ in the tomb? If he got on there on Friday, and then he spent all of Saturday, and then Sunday morning he arose. Listen, Joseph, to be quite honest with you, I have not spent uh, any time academically trying to study how that works out. The, the simplest answer I have received and I have chosen to accept is that if you actually count the number of calendar days in which the Lord was in the tomb, he was there on Friday. He was there for all of Saturday, and according to the liturgical calendar and the Jewish calendar, Sunday actually begins in the evening of Saturday. So that's why when we pray Vespers, we'll always pray the Vespers of that following day. So that Vespers portion is actually belonging to that new day. So the same day that he was there on Friday, and then the eve of Saturday, and then all of Saturday, and the eve of Sunday, and Sunday morning he rises from the dead, we see it as he spent three days in the tomb. Now whether or not scientifically that adds up, I really don't think that's what the purpose of the passage is. I don't think the purpose of the passage is to say the same way that the Lord, that Jonah spent exactly 72 hours in the belly of the whale, so also the Lord will spend exactly 72 hours in the tomb. I don't think it's about the number of hours. I simply think that this is the exact same sign. He's saying that the symbol that was given to them, and a man has risen from the dead, so also this will be given to these people. So Joseph, forgive me, I know it's a very humble and... Um, maybe not satisfying answer, but I hope you'll approach it simply the way that I have because um, I'd rather not lose myself in those kind of questions. They can get more frustrating than anything else. As for your second question, why does the Lord use that language? So I've heard both of these theories. The first theory that I have read from theologians who have studied the time of Christ is that he really is speaking about his cousins. Those people that at that time to call someone a brother or a direct relative is to say that we share the blood. So because we have a sharing inheritance in each other's blood, uh, in that sense where you and I come from the same lineage, we have the same ancestors in that sense where an immediate, an immediate um, parental lineage is found, where our parents are siblings. If both of our fathers or both of our mothers share in that brotherhood, so we also were called brothers, and that's very contextual to the time of Christ. And so this is why you'll hear things like James the brother of Jesus, right? Or he calls them and he says, my brothers and my sisters. And I want you to notice how even in that same passage that you reference, when they tell him, your brothers and sisters and your mother are outside waiting for you, his actual response is what? Who are my brothers and my sisters? All of you are my brothers and my sisters. If you fulfill that, if you continue reading in that passage, it actually goes to show that He's completely redefining what that means. Now, obviously, in the Orthodox tradition, we really do believe that the Holy Virgin Mother remains a virgin eternally, and she did not have any other children afterwards. And the proof of that also is found in the fact that when the Lord is on the, um, is on the cross, He does not leave His mother in the care of one of her biological children, because she doesn't have any. He leaves her in the care of John. And tradition actually teaches us that she lived in the house of John for several years after the resurrection of Christ. So we know for a fact that she did not have any other biological family, any other biological children, because he does not entrust her to um, another person other than his disciple, John. Now, as for your question, why does he choose to do this? Why could he not have chosen language that would lead to less confusion? I, I need us to understand how we approach Scripture. I mean, that Scripture, Christ probably spoken in Aramaic or in Jewish. It was written down in Greek by the early apostles, translated much later in English. Every word has to be studied in its original context. Not to mention the fact that we also have to take into consideration that what is written and worse is what is spoken are two very different things. The same way that, you know, there are words that are spoken that are very metaphorical that when they are spoken at that time, they are understood in a certain way, but us who several centuries later are reading them in a different language in which it was spoken and not understanding the context of that saying at that time, 
we can oftentimes think, take things completely out of place. And that's why we go back to the early church and ask, how did they understand it? Because they understood the time, they understood the language, they understood the context. So Habiba, I pray that answers your question. I don't think Christ meant it to be confusing. I don't think at that moment when he spoke that, uh, that very specific sentence, that he was also considering the hundreds of different translations that would exist and the arguments that are being made at that time. And the way that he, he, he gives us some sort of closure on this is that the Holy Spirit speaks through the early church fathers and those who left us commentary to understand how it is that we approach this. And this is something that's absolutely unanimous. When you take a look at the early church fathers, the ever-virgin Holy Theotokos is considered to be absolutely childless after the nativity of Christ by many, if not all, of the church fathers that we have in the church. I hope that answers your question, Joseph. We'll answer one last question, my beloved, from Mark. He says, Hi Abuna, and God bless you. Thank you, Habibi. God bless you too. I have a question. How can I answer those who tell me that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not one? Thank you, Abuna, and keep me in your prayers. So it really does depend on what you mean by they're not one there, Mark. Uh, because we don't believe them to be one in the sense where it's the same being. We really do believe there is three hypostases in one essence. So what do we mean by this? And I would urge you, because this is a very complex theological affair when we talk about the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, we tried as best as we can to be able to um, unpack it in a series of videos that we did on the Holy Trinity. I would urge you, if you want a lot more detail, you can go to um, the website, CopticOrthodoxAnswers.org, and if you search out the series or the playlist on the Trinity, it'll give you a little bit more detail as to how we understand that doctrine. But just to make sure that I can somehow answer you very quickly for that question that you asked. When we say that the Holy Trinity is one, what we're saying there is that they are one in essence. That doesn't necessarily mean that the Father is the Son who is the Holy Spirit. It's not one being who puts on several hats. Sometimes I'm the Father, sometimes I'm the Son, sometimes I'm the Holy Spirit. That's actually a heresy called modalism. So we definitely don't believe that they are one in that sense. They are truly distinct. And when I say distinct, I'm not saying that they are different. I'm not saying that they are in conflict. What I'm saying is that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. Each of them is their own person, their own hypostasis, but they are one in essence. Now, how are the three one? This is precisely the mystery of the, of the Trinity. We believe this doctrine to be mysterious because we can't possibly understand it fully. And so what I would like to tell you is that while we believe that they are one in essence, they have one will, they move towards each other in this movement called perichoresis, that there is a kenotic love that exists between them, that, you know, St. Gregory, the theologian, he says it beautifully, he says, as soon as I think of the three, I immediately am brought back to remembering that they are one. And the more I think of him as one, the more I also realize that they are three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the mystery. The mystery of realizing that the three are one, and that that oneness is not uniformity, it's unity. And that the three, and truly they are diverse, there is diversity there, but there is no division among them. Again, to make this sound in any, to, to, to justify, not to justify, to honor the Holy Trinity properly, and to try to make sense of it as best as we can, I would urge you, Maybe go see some of the resources that we put up in the videos. I think you'll have a much better chance of being able to embrace that answer. So I hope that answers your question, Mark, and forgive me if um, I didn't go deeper than that. My beloved, it's already been 45 minutes. Time really flies when we were those that we love. Um, I can't thank you enough again for participating. We urge you, please, continue to pray for us. We're approaching Lent, the most blessed period of the year. Um, Pray for us and remember us during this Lenten period. Pray for us that God may continue to inspire us to try to answer as many questions as we can. Pray for the ministry. Pray that God uses it for the glory of His holy name. Share the content with anyone that you think can benefit from us. But most importantly, please remember us in your prayers as we also pray for the success of the church and the body of Christ. To God be all glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.